Occitania is a region in the south of France that stretches from the Pyrenees to the Mediterranean coast. The region is known for its rich history and culture, its picturesque villages and its breathtaking scenery. The region is divided into several landscapes, including the Pyrenees, the Cévennes, the Garrigue, the Dordogne Valley and the Languedoc vineyards. One of the most famous landscapes in the region is the Ardèche, known for its picturesque villages, deep gorges and rivers. The Ardèche also offers numerous outdoor activities such as canoeing, hiking and climbing. There are numerous ski resorts and mountain villages in the Pyrenees that can be visited in both summer and winter. Another highlight of the region is the Pont du Gard, a Roman aqueduct and UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is located near Nîmes in the Gard. The city of Nîmes is also a well-known tourist destination and is famous for its well-preserved Roman ruins, including the Maison Carré and the Arena. Join us now on the first part of our journey through the most beautiful places in Occitania. If you like this video please support the Travel Owl channel with a like, a comment or a subscription. Thank you. The history of Narbonne dates back to ancient times. The city was founded by the Romans in 118 BC as the first Roman colony in Gaul and was named Narbo Martius. As an important trading center and capital of the province of Gallia Narbonensis, Narbonne quickly developed into an important place in the region and for the empire as a whole. This is why Narbonne was nicknamed the Second Rome. Roman rule left behind numerous architectural treasures, including the famous Via Domitia, a road that connected Narbonne with the city of Rome. In the 5th century, Narbonne was conquered by the Visigoths and experienced a further boom under their rule. The city later became part of France and experienced a period of economical and cultural prosperity in the Middle Ages. Today, Narbonne is a modern city that is proud of its rich history. The well-preserved historic center and its historical monuments bear witness to the glorious times of the past. Visitors can discover the fascinating history of Narbonne by exploring the ancient ruins, the cathedral and other historical sites. Lourdes is probably one of the most famous French towns, and the small town owes its fame primarily to the apparitions of the Virgin Mary. It was in 1858 when a young girl, Bernadette Subaru, repeatedly saw a woman in white clothes. Bernadette entered the convent in 1866 and was canonized in 1933, and Lourdes became one of the most important pilgrimage sites of the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. Today, the main source of income for the almost 15,000 inhabitants is pilgrimage tourism. One of the stops for the pilgrims who flock to Lourdes every year is, of course, the Grotto of Massabiel, which forms the center of the holy district and where the immaculately conceived Mary appeared to the 14-year-old Bernadette. To this day, the water in the grotto is said to have healing powers, but these have not been scientifically proven. Nevertheless, Millions of pilgrims hope for a spontaneous healing every year. The Basilica of the Immaculate Conception and the Basilica of the Rosary are located near the grotto. 
Due to the masses of visitors, you should book early, because although the city is small, it has more overnight stays every year than Paris, for example. There are said to be 6 million overnight stays per year. The city's long history reached its peak in the Middle Ages, when Perpignan was proclaimed the seat of the Mallorcan kings and attracted a wealthy bourgeoisie. The region's mild climate is particularly favorable for fruit and wine growing. The first sweet cherries are harvested in the orchards near Perpignan as early as March and the fruit year ends with the autumn grape harvest. The vacation season in and around Perpignan is significantly longer than in other French regions. Visitors to the town benefit from 300 days of sunshine a year, a very attractive, gentle landscape and friendly hosts. Perpignan has an old town that is well worth seeing, built mainly in the Gothic style. Playful elements point to Spanish influences. Only remnants of the once strong city wall remain today. One of the most important medieval secular buildings is the large fortress, behind whose thick walls stands the former royal palace of the Mallorcan royal family. The old town hall is also worth a visit. It is located not far from St. Jean Baptista Cathedral. Perpignan's main train station impresses with its murals created by the artist Salvatore Dali. The city center surprises visitors with its tranquil atmosphere. Many small squares with lovely cafes, typical restaurants and good stores invite you to stroll around. Set is known as the Venice of Languedoc due to its many canals. Watch fishing boats jostle for space in the network of canals, learn about urban heroes in the local museums and enjoy fresh seafood from the nearby lagoon. The city was founded in 1666 on the orders of Louis XIV. Construction began both in the city and at the port at the mouth of the Canal du Midi. After the port was built, Set flourished. It still plays an important role as a fishing center today. Stroll along the 17th century canals and the pastel colored houses. Keep your eyes peeled for the Canal Royal, where a boat jousting tournament takes place every year in which two boats attack each other with lances. Climb Mont Saint Clair or take a bus or cab to the top and enjoy the view of the Mediterranean and the Languedoc Mountains. Visit the Musée Paul Valéry near the summit. The museum is dedicated to the famous poet and author of Symbolicis, who was born in Set. Spend an afternoon at La Corniche Beach, perfect for swimming and sunbathing. It is located about 1.5 kilometers east of the old port. Back in the port area, you'll be spoiled for choice with the numerous fish and seafood restaurants on the quayside. The Canal du Midi stretches 240 kilometers from Toulouse to the Mediterranean. Built in the 17th century, it is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Originally, the waterway was built as a shortcut for boat traffic between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Today it mainly serves as a tourist attraction. Houseboat vacations on the Canal du Midi are very popular. This is mainly due to the landscape around the canal, but also to the numerous bridges and locks. One special feature is the Malpas Canal Tunnel. Near Set, the Canal du Midi flows into the Etan de Tau. A vacation with a houseboat on the Canal du Midi offers plenty of variety in terms of scenery. Passing beautiful vineyards, the waterway is often lined with plain trees, poplars, cypresses or pines. 
The trees provide shade and lend the canal a mystical air. The individual stops and pace of the journey are determined by the guest. The waterway leads past small towns and villages. Carcassonne, Bézier and Ogde are some of the best-known towns along the canal. Numerous harbors along the canal do midi invite you to moor and linger. Holidaymakers can get all the supplies they need in the towns. Regional markets offer fresh products from the region. There are numerous restaurants along the canal. Guests will find Mediterranean dishes and wines from the surrounding area on the menus. French cuisine is renowned for its variety and quality. The former capital of the Corbière La Grassa is located far away from the crowds of tourists to the southeast of medieval Carcassonne. The medieval buildings are almost completely preserved, giving visitors a good insight into medieval town structures. Well-preserved townhouses, the market hall dating back to the early 14th century, the Pont Vieux stone bridge, the town walls and, last but not least, the Saint Marie d'Orbeau Abbey, all of this looks like something straight out of a picture book and makes the village in the Val d'Orbeau one of the most beautiful villages in France. On the other bank of the river Orbeau is the Abbaye Saint Marie d'Orbeau. The history of this Benedictine abbey dates back to the end of the 8th century. The monastery's possessions even extended as far as Spain in the 9th and 10th centuries. The newer part of the abbey with the cloister was built in the 18th century. The Abbaye Saint Marie d'Orbeau can also be visited at certain times. In its dimensions, in its technical details and not least in its appearance. It is even a blessing for the residents of Milo. In the high season, they used to suffer from traffic chaos, traffic jams, many accidents and, above all, eternal waiting times. With the opening of the viaduct in 2004, all that was history. Although, there are also travelers who still prefer the traditional route. They want to admire the viaduct from below. It really is worth seeing from every perspective. Today, the Milo Viaduct is the longest cable-stayed bridge in the world and, with a maximum pier height of 343 meters, the highest structure in France. In the Massif Central in southern France, it is a section of the A75 highway that runs from Bézier to Clermont-Ferrand. With its impressive architecture, it spans the valley of the small river Tarn for almost two and a half kilometers. The cars undertake this journey at an almost dizzying height of up to 270 meters above sea level. This not only speeds up the vacation journey, it also makes it a real experience. Whether you actually arrive at your destination sooner is perhaps even the question. The viaduct is a real sight and many travelers actually take the time to admire it at length. Bézier is located in the French department of Aero in the east of the Occitanie region, not far from the Gulf du Lyon on the French Mediterranean coast. The nearest airport is Cap Dog Airport, around 20 minutes by car from the city centre. Montpellier is an hour's drive to the northeast along the coast. The panorama alone suggests how steeped in history Bézier really is. From the remains of an ancient amphitheater to the red roofs in the city center and the arena in the east of the city, the Roman influence on the Mediterranean old town is omnipresent. Bézier owes its wealth, which can be seen not least in the Allée Paul Roquette with its Osman facades, to wine growing. The Saint Nazaire at Saint Cell's Cathedral is the city's unmistakable landmark. The Gothic monument is enthroned on a hill and overlooks the river Orb which crosses the world-famous Canal du Midi at this point. 
The latter is ideal for a houseboat trip to both Set and Toulouse. Here you can also marvel at the Fonseyran's lock staircase from the 17th century. No less impressive is the Orbe Aqueduct, a canal bridge that carries the Canal du Midi across the river. The bricks of Albi Cathedral glow a rich reddish-brown in the evening light. The last rays of sunlight bathe the west façade in a warm light, as if it were glowing from within. St. Cecile is a masterpiece of Gothic architecture, but anyone thinking of soaring, finely chiseled walls and pillars is very much mistaken. The church lies like a huge block of brick that has fallen from the sky on the hill above the river Tarn. With its defiant tower and windows like embrasures, it looks like a fortress. The old town surrounding the unusual building has been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The fact that the building looks more like a fortress than a place of worship is due to the turbulent history of the region. It was the scene of a brutal crusade against the fundamentalist Cathar movement. The ascetic Cathars were a thorn in the side of the medieval church, whose clergy reveled in luxury. Right next to the cathedral is the equally massive Episcopal Palace, the Palais de la Burbie. It is an irony of history that the brothel scenes of the city's most famous son, the painter Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, are exhibited here of all places. How fortunate for Albi that the artist's work was too daring for the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. Today there are around 1,000 works by Toulouse-Lautrec in Albi, around a third of his entire oeuvre. Art lovers from all over the world come to the small town, even the Japanese emperor has been there. A visit to this city is like a trip back in time. Stroll through the medieval streets and admire the architecture of its buildings. You are in a city with an eventful history. It was first under Roman occupation. They tapped the water from the Ur Valley, which rises in Uzes, and piped it to Neen. To this end, they built a 49 kilometers long aqueduct, the most famous section of which has been preserved to this day. That's right. It's the Pont du Gard. From the 5th century onwards, it developed into a powerful bishopric, the Diocese of Uzes became one of the most important in Languedoc in the following centuries. The city's landmark is the Ducal Palace. Uzes is also known for being the first duchy in France in 1632 and is still the oldest French duchy still in existence today. As you stroll through the old town, you will discover a number of landscape elements that seem to have fallen out of time, the former St. Theodoret Cathedral and its Fenestrelle Tower, the Renaissance or neoclassical mansions, the medieval alleyways, the mysterious gardens or the Ducal Palace La Douche. The Cévennes are an area in the south of France, a mountain range located between Ardèche and Aero and part of the foothills of the Massif Central. A large part of the Cévennes is part of the Cévennes National Park. Mountains, 
gorges, plateaus, valleys and wild rivers and torrents characterize the wild south of France, a region of small villages and towns. One advantage is the short distance to the Mediterranean, approximately 60 kilometers. Montpellier is also not far away, approximately 50 kilometers. What makes the Cévennes so special are the rivers and torrents, chestnuts, transhumans, natural stone houses with their slate roofs and silkworm breeding with the associated silk spinning mill. So if your dream destination is in the south and doesn't have to be the Mediterranean, then the Cévennes are just the place for you. The bizarrely rugged mountain landscape is climatically influenced by the Mediterranean and offers plenty of opportunities for swimming with its many rivers and small streams. A swim is also the ideal way to cool off after a strenuous hike. The impressive landscape will make your hiking vacation unforgettable. The River Tarn, for example, is an excellent place to swim. But be careful, it is a river. So there is always a small current, stones on the bottom and a pebble beach. We definitely recommend a pair of shoes for swimming. Montpellier offers travelers plenty of variety. You can enjoy the warm Mediterranean Sea on the nearby beach or explore the historic, medieval old town and cathedral. Admire the modern architecture in the Antigone district, which attracts many young people to the city. Old and new are combined in Montpellier in the most exciting way. The Place de la Comédie is the heart, pulse and cultural hub of Montpellier. Located in the city center, it is one of the largest pedestrian zones in Europe and home to countless bars, restaurants and, of course, the eponymous L'Opera Comédie. The Three Graces have been lolling on the central fountain for almost 250 years, surrounded by Wilhelminian-style buildings. Don't forget to visit the square in the evening or at night. A blue band of light then bathes the scenery in a magical light. It circles the square in an oval shape, which is why the Place de la Comédie is simply called Luf, the egg, by locals. Just northwest of the Place de la Comédie is Likasson, Montpellier's historic old town. Here you will find charming little squares and winding alleyways bursting with sights. These include Montpellier Cathedral and the Basilica of Notre Dame de Table. You will also come across good restaurants. There are also around 80 city palaces, the Hôtel Particulière, with their eye-catching sandstone facades and high stucco ceilings. The picturesque village of saint guilhem le desert is located in a rugged gorge around 40 kilometers northwest of Montpellier. It is one of the most beautiful villages in France and is therefore overrun with tourists. The impressive abbey of saint guilhem le desert located in the middle of the village on the Verdus River, is therefore best visited out of season or at least at the beginning of the week. The monastery was founded in 804 by William of Jelon, grandson of Charles Martel and therefore also related to Charlemagne. At this time, William retired to the desert as a simple monk after successful campaigns against the Moors. 
Since his canonization in 1066 at the latest, the abbey has been an important stage on the Isle branch of the Way of St. James and thus the destination of many pilgrims, even today. The ensemble consists of a three-aisled abbey church with a tower and three abbeys, cloister, chapter house, now a museum, and monastery buildings. The current state of the building dates back mainly to the 13th century, although parts, including the crypt, are significantly older. The high and narrow, completely unadorned nave in the Lombard style is impressive. Curiously, a part of the cloister that was dismantled in the course of secularization after the French Revolution is now in New York, the cloisters, a great loss, but one that hardly detracts from the magical attraction of the place. The monastery is now run by Carmelites. The Pont du Gard is one of the best-preserved Roman structures in the whole of Europe. Magnificent, imposing, downright ingenious. The Pont du Gard is nothing more than part of a water pipeline that crosses the river Gard and supplied the city of Nîmes with fresh drinking water from the springs near Uzes. The Pont du Gard impresses both aesthetically and technically. Its uniqueness makes it well worth a visit. Over 1,000 people are said to have worked on the aqueduct for three years until it was completed in the 1st century AD. In the valley of the river garden, the aqueduct had to cross a very wide river valley. The most famous part of the aqueduct, the Pont du Gard, was built. It has a total height of 49 meters and a length of 275 meters. It consists of three rows of arcades, two imposing ones and an almost delicate-looking top row of arches that carry the water channel. The entire structure was built using a typical Roman ashlar construction method, whereby the ashlars were cut to fit so precisely that they could be placed on top of each other without mortar. The mutual pressure held them together. The best view of the aqueduct is from the adjacent slopes, which can be easily reached on foot. From here you can see many interesting details and take wonderful photos. Thank you.